lot to cover there. <laughs> but good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being up nice and early. Um, like Chris mentioned, if you're ever in Oakland, please stop by the tasting room. I'm happy to pour you some wine and go deeper into any of the topics we have lined up today. Uh, and his, his business card for his business is oh, attached yeah. to one of your pages here. Yeah. And there were a couple of slide editions also, and those are the, the color ones there. Also on that second little packet, there's also a flavor wheel. If you haven't seen one of those, it's a really handy tool uh, as far as getting comfortable with talking about wine and the descriptors, fruits, you know, is strawberry the same as red cherry, black cherry, those kind of fine grain differentiations. And then just for the sake of interest, um, the sheet after that is what the Court of Masters Sommeliers, which I'm only a level two on their for four level certification thing. This is the grid that they go through every time they taste a wine. It's sort of an analytical tool. If you, there are a couple of movies out now that cover sommelier life. And if you ever see one of them swirls, sniff and taste, they'll actually go through each of these lines. Color, body, tannin, fruit, primary, secondary. <coughs> and then use those things to guess vintage, uh, where the grape is from. Um, yeah, it's pretty remarkable. I am not proficient with it. I'm always amazed when I taste with sommeliers who are. Um, but this, like the, the flavor wheel, are good primers to just get comfortable with the language of wine, describing what you're tasting, but also in the process of describing it, it also affects what you're tasting. If you tell yourself you're you might be smelling fennel, I guarantee in five seconds. It will be nothing but, you know, full-on anise explosion. Um, and that's part of the fun, though, of wine tasting. It's kind of plastic, but it's also a little bit, a little bit, there's, there's some rock-solid foundation to some of the things that we experience. But then we, we integrate and interpolate those things differently. So, but we'll come back to that in a lot more detail. Um, but just a couple of general points. Uh, if there are wines that you don't like, that's okay. Not everybody is tolerant of large, big, tannic reds or really high acid white wines. Um, there's some amount of plasticity. I know there are things that I hated as a child and young adult that I like now. So our tastes and preferences can migrate but if you really hate red wines and you've been trying to drink them for years and just don't like the way they feel, that's okay. Embrace that. There's a whole, a whole world of underrepresented white wines. Conversely, if you don't like whites, they're just, you know, something about them. And we're also realizing that there are lots of compounds that we're still discovering in wines. You could have a legitimate allergy to something in the wine or something that's a sensitivity um, and that's fine too, you're not going to change that. Uh, I am kind of oak sensitive a little bit. Uh, cloves and cardamom make my lips swell when I taste them. Uh, and oak barrels can contain some of those compounds. So occasionally if I taste a specific, uh, I think it's American oak that actually seems to have higher levels of that for me, but I can sometimes get lip tingling and swelling not enjoyable, it's hard to enjoy the wine. So the wines I make are pretty low oak because of that. So it's just a thing, don't worry too much about it. And we tend to converge when we taste. I know it's all subjective is sort of the, the thing that we say, but generally we all sort of arrive in the middle. There aren't too many wines I've tasted with other people where they say I'm getting peaches and the other person says, no, it's dried plum. Maybe cherry is red or black, but we tend to converge for the most part. And then there are nuances around the edges, and that's where it gets kind of fun with discussion and being able to pick things out of wines that are unusual. Uh, sometimes I just had a Cab Franc I tasted with a group of people, and it had a cumin note in it. 
Hmm. And once we sort of like nailed down, like, what is that? What is that? Kind of put a name on it. And we were like, oh, okay, now that's really cool. It went from being a mysterious, like, I don't think I like that sort of thing. And then once somebody's like, oh, it's cumin, then everybody felt much more comfortable with it and was able to enjoy that particular aspect. So it's all fun. There's no right or wrong, necessarily, unless you're it's totally wrong. <laughs> uh, and definitely don't I really think part of the fun I haven't traveled as much as I would like to but every time I talk to somebody who's traveled to a wine region they talk about actually seeing what the vineyards look like where the wine was made feeling the humidity, the heat in the summer um, it really changes their understanding of wine even these master sommeliers if you can't really get a feel for Portuguese wines until maybe you visited Portugal. So, great place to explore for whites and reds. North is very different from the south, from what I understand. I haven't been there, so I probably tasted a thousand Portuguese wines, but you know, until you get to kind of travel and see it and hear the stories, uh, it's all a little bit elusive. So, if you ever get the chance to do that, definitely snap it up. And talking about wine is often a source of stress. It still is for me, especially in a group of people. Um, we get together and do blind tasting. I, it's been a while since I've done one, to be honest. But we were doing Wednesday morning blind tastings just to kind of stay sharp. And we would use that same grid that's in the back. And being the first person to go through it and kind of hazard, you know, stone fruit, white peach, maybe a little bit of blah, 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 mm -hmm. it still stresses everybody out. <laughs> so just embrace that. It's OK. Um, one interesting thing for me personally is I'm really into sort of being able to historically understand things. So the wines we drink today, these screw cap, super fresh whites with big fruit, uh, big round but smooth but heavy and dark reds, they're a pretty new invention. They did not exist so much uh, just 50 years ago. We've really as a wine consuming culture come a long way from the 50s and 60s when three out of every five bottles sold was either California Madeira, Madeira uh, or Port, all sweet wines, to where we're at now, Napa Valley, Big Reds, that kind of thing. And then even migrating further, um, we're seeing more and more diversity in the market. Weird varietals are cool all of a sudden, uh, micro producers, you're even seeing ancient winemaking methods, like making wine in amphoras. Uh, there's uh, something called an orange wine, which is a really traditional sort of ancient winemaking style that practically every little producer I know in the Bay Area made an orange wine last year you know, based on this Georgian method from 2,000 years ago. So coming full circle, uh, but it's a great time to be a wine lover, but there's a lot of diversity out there, probably more than ever. So it can be confusing. The flip side is you have the better, the best chance ever historically of getting a reasonably good bottle. Cork taint is at an all-time low. Uh, wine filtration technology is, you know, pretty much eliminated for large producers. A lot of variability. Small producers like us, we still kind of live with that, especially when we do unfined, unfiltered, spontaneous fermentation stuff. It's li it's a little more risky. Um, but that can be part of the fun too, exploring what small producers do that have a little more hand on the product compared to Gallo or you know, a commodity project, which ha those certainly have their place as well. When I go to Thanksgiving dinner with the family, I'm not bringing my best wine. I'm, I'm <laughs> grabbing Gallo for the family. So. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So. Uh, and then I don't think we need to go into history. There are several great books out there if you want to really dig into from ancient wine to even just, uh, I think there's a book called The Rise of American Wine by Paul McCosh. There's a great uh, California encyclopedia of wine. Um, I just blanked on his name. Uh, he lives in San Jose. It's all alph alphabetical. It's a legitimate encyclopedia, but it's a great resource if you want to know when, when did Petit Syrah get on the radar find it used for 10 bucks, but 20 bucks new. It's a great 
historical document in the California wine industry. Um, but wine's been with us for a long time. There's always the question, what did ancient wine taste like? That's any sort of archeological food, wine, beer, anything like that. There's always that question. Didn't really have the packaging technology, maybe not so much temperature control. Um, you know, there was a lot of spices added to wine, sometimes salty water, uh, different things. So obviously, it wasn't always fresh out of the bottles, Sonoma County, Russian River, you know, going on in southern Italy in the year zero. Um, but on the other side, I think we should also not whitewash too much the fact that there must have been some things that got through and were pretty amazing. There's a little bit of viticultural data that kind of filtered down, and they understood grape ripeness, they understood trellising, they understood vineyard work better, better than some of us. So I'm sure it was a mixed bag. Uh, I'm sure the king on the hill drank something different than the people uh, by the gates of the city. Um, there was probably some really cool stuff too. And in getting from there to here, we probably lost a lot of grapes also that went extinct and had some unique things to say. Uh, the Romans did a lot just because they spread everywhere and they had a lot of that sort of structural technology and will to just organize, plant, feed the troops wine, produce, and if you think about feeding, uh, militaristic history may not be the best way to do it, but you know, feeding 100,000 people as they migrate into China the whole time. There's some amazing logistics at work. And while the Romans were traveling around, they found things that were indigenous as far as we know, like Cabernet Franc in France. Um, that's important. The grape, you know, if, if anybody here likes Cabernet Sauvignon, as far as we know, it did not exist 300 years ago. It's a relatively new mutation uh, between Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. And here it is, the king of all grapes, just a few hundred years later. And Bordeaux did not have any Cabernet Franc <coughs> in 1700. That wine that was being exported everywhere that was already famous was based on Carmelaire, a grape that you only see in Chile these days. So it's a lot of, lot of shifting and changing. Uh, Spanish, of course, brought wines. Uh, one of the interesting flashpoints, though, historically, is phylloxera. Uh, the root louse that really just, uh, that and Pierce's disease, which uh, completely, almost completely wiped out all Los Angeles wine in 1900. Those are a couple of very big threats to the wine industry that sort of come up and go away. Um, I think I just read that there may have been a phylloxera explosion in Australia in an isolated place just in the last week. It's something we think we get under control and then things sort of adapt and change. Um, but what Phylloxera did was it decimated vineyards here and then it got exported to Europe. And it really, unless you're in a specific type of soil, like really sandy soil, because these are little creatures kind of burrowing around on the roots and the sand, they can't really, it, it hurts them to do that. Um, there are a few soil types that are Phylloxera free, uh, but it changed the face of wine around that. Bordeaux people were going to Spain trying to plant things, and you can find Cabernet plantings from 1900 in areas of Spain from those Bordeaux people traveling. Uh, if you like Rhone, Rhone wines, southern, uh, southeastern France, nice warm climate, uh, kind of full body, they're great for California wine drinkers that want to sort of spread into a new area. Those are mostly based on Grenache. There really wasn't any Grenache there before 1900. That was because phylloxera wiped everything out, and it was mostly Morfed, which is a grape we only see a little bit in California, but Grenache, it grafted easier, it grew faster, it produced more crop, and it changed the mix there. Um, and that happened a lot all around the world. We had diversity here in California that we lost. There are definitely grapes that have been taken that are now from Europe, planted here, that are now probably extinct that we'll never see again because of that. So that did affect the wine industry a lot and just the face of wine. It happened to arise again in Napa Valley in the 70s, 70s, 80s. There was a rootstock, and the trick with that is that's why you graft vines. You have the roots that are immune to it and then you have the grapevine on top. Uh, the roots that they thought were okay 
turned out not to be. And suddenly Napa Valley had phylloxera all over again with the booming wine industry. And if you drive through Napa now, you'll actually see tons of vineyard blocks ripped out and monstrous piles of grapevines. That's because at about 25 years of age, 25, 30, the vines start producing less. And uh, the, the accountant tells you, you've got to rip those out for your plant. And we're at that 25, 30 year cycle right now in a lot of Napa Valley vineyards. So you'll see a lot of pulled out acreage, which is, you know, that's prime real estate. So. They don't want to do that unless they absolutely have to. Um, but specifically with California, uh, is anybody not from California here? Okay, cool. I am woefully ignorant of the wine industry outside of California, and I apologize for that. I know Ohio and you know every state is growing grape and making wine. So I have a lot to learn on that side. Um, I only know sort of the California perspective my family had a little little bit in in the 40s 50s 60s um, but California open land you had water you have the peculiarity of the Sierra snow melt so you sort of have like a water bank that happens in the winter uh, melt down in the summer so you have sources of water government kind of giving out land after the gold rush it was a pretty open thing lots of entrepreneurial Europeans came as well as, you know, gold digger, Yosemite Sam types. That was very important. Italians came. There's a huge history of German winemakers that is not very well documented at all. But they were sort of like notori notoriously famous for their winemaking skills, sort of employed by all these places. There's a whole sad labor history of the Chinese who actually performed a lot of field labor in less than ideal conditions. Um, but the California wine industry just sort of exploded, and we had hundreds and hundreds of different grapes here. We didn't, we, it's kind of a gray area, like, if the farmers were specifically planting things for diversity. Um, today, we want, you know, Toriga Nacional clone 03, not 02, because 03 is more perfume. We think about it like a grocery store when we're planting a vineyard. Um, that wasn't necessarily the case back then. It was more like, what produces, and what did my family grow up with? Oh, and also, what can I get? So, but a lot of things came from, especially with Italians, uh, some of the homeland came over in the form of cuttings. Railway, being able to transport grapes to, say, New York, so people there could make wine from them, that shaped a lot of what was planted in California. Just interesting to think about that side of it. Um, and generally, before Prohibition, lighter, more quote-unquote elegant European-style wines were the fashion. The, the Bordeaux Claret, which is actually not a full-bodied red wine at all, but more like a light, quaffable red. That's what was popular. So this big, you know, dark cupcake, midnight velvet, $12 sort of confected monstrosity that's so fascinating. Um, that's a pretty new thing. That wasn't necessarily common then. But again, we shouldn't shortchange the fact that there were, you know, Petite Syrah and Morvedre are pretty dense, dark grapes, and they were planted in a lot of places. They might, maybe they weren't being harvested at right, but definitely darker wines were out there. Napa Valley was already known in the 1880s and winning medals around the world for some of the wines. And then today, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, there's this category of natural wine, which is slowly gaining, gaining steam. Uh, the youngsters like it for the most part. It's more of a back to nature, uh, they say low intervention, but stays away from a lot of the technology. It's more artisanal, I guess that's the key to it. Uh, usually organic grapes, usually uh, you use ambient yeast instead of inoculating the must with an industrial yeast, which is kind of seen as bad. The wines are unfined, unfiltered, etc. And it's more of a back to the basics sort of winemaking thing that has authenticity. So there are some great wines that fall within that category. There's a lot of stuff that I don't personally care for that much. And it's a huge world in between. So I can certainly share a couple producers if you want to try some of those more adventurous oddball styles. 
But just like regular wine, you kind of get what you pay for. And with natural wine, it's even more of a roulette game. So, um, but probably if there's just one main topic today, it's just trying to get today here. Uh, just trying to get comfortable describing wines, thinking about what you're tasting, and not just the sense of fruit, you know, fennel, blah, 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 but just thinking kind of structurally about, is this a tannic wine? Is this an acidic wine? Can I tell the difference between those two things? There's always a third question, is that important? But that's a different seminar. <laughs> um, and it really comes down a lot to just getting comfortable with the language. And the only way to do that, I know, because I'm still struggling with foreign languages, is practice. And wine is not actually that unusual. Uh, if you go to a cheese tasting with cheese experts, they're going to use very similar. This brie has apple and pear notes, baked pear. A lot of the Sauvignon Blanc descriptors, green grass, of course, you're going to get that in, in the milk. Um, funky washed rind cheeses, and suddenly you're in the world of coffee grounds and unfermented chocolate and all sorts of really interesting things. I've had cheeses that were certainly described as clovey, nutmeggy, allspice. Is that mace or nutmeg? You know, beer, same thing. Coffee, same thing. Um, when I was looking through the flavor wheels in your packet, uh, one of the <laughs> First time I've seen this one was an oyster flavor wheel. <laughs> so pretty interesting, you know, getting into all of those iodine salty, is it, you know, Malden salt, French celery, or more aggressive Sicilian, because there are different mineral contents and little plankton bits in there. So think of it as fun <laughs> rather than as fun. Uh, but practice is the key. And it's important because it really will as you get more comfortable with it, it will open up the world of what you're tasting. I don't understand the full neural pathway of that, but it is an interactive process. So I encourage you to, to play with it in a supportive environment um, where people won't laugh at you. <laughs> Until you get to the point where you make them laugh at you. And then that's, that's fun because then you, like, you're pretty confident in what you're tasting. You can sometimes test other people when you throw out oddballs. That's always fun in the group tasting as well. Um, I wanted to mention the four vino types of tasters. This little chart has become more nuanced, but it just sort of illustrates some of the difference between our taste preferences. I don't really like the nomenclature for it, but we'll just go with it. Um, so this race basically breaks tasters, and it's not just wine. Part of the protocol for this is like, how do you like your coffee? How do you like your tea? Do you only drink white tea, green tea, black tea? Do you have to have milk in your coffee? Sort of assessing sensitivity to bitterness and uh, acidity, factors like that. So the most sensitive type of taster is the sweet category. These are people who only, only really want sweet, smooth wines. They're definitely sensitive to acid, you know, that really sort of prickly, tart sensation gets very overpowering very quickly. And tannin is a really hard one for this group. That big, dry, like rustic kind of cowboy wine <coughs> is definitely a no-no. Generally, these are pe people who would never drink whiskey, something like that. Uh, <coughs> just way too aggressive. Usually sensitive to chili peppers, uh, even white pepper, uh, lots of different things. And oddly enough, if you look at the percentage, women tend to be more sensitive than men by a you know, pretty significant factor. Hypersensitive is one step down. Um, and this is, it's sort of a catch-all, but when they were constructing this, they were being careful to include a lot of dedicated wine drinkers. I think this is one of the reasons it skewed so high. So a lot of people that already had a lot of wine knowledge um, were comfortable with diversity different foods. A lot of wine people are heavy foodies. <coughs> so, you know, as you explore different cultures, start eating more Thai food, more Malaysian food, more Georgian food, um, just like with wine, your diversity, uh, ability to appreciate diversity increases. Uh, the hypersensitive we usually think of as like the Pinot drinkers. 
is sort of the fussy category. Um, we like them, they have a lot to say about wines, but they're pretty particular. Uh, their wines, yeah, usually they like to describe finesse or balance or grace. Um, usually they like whites as well as reds, but those more ethereal pinot and lighter bodied uh, reds are generally the favorites. The sensitive are people who just pretty much can go anywhere. Um, and I think actually the percentages have changed a little bit. The hypersensitive is condensed, and now I think the sensitive might be regarded as the larger group. And they're actually relatively insensitive uh, in the best possible way. Uh, they just can take a lot. Uh, you know, let's go to Moroccan food tonight, and, you know, sushi the next night, delicate, and big, bold, spicy, Mexican the next. Um, it's a good category to be in. You can, you can take a lot of things and appreciate them. Uh, and they like diversity. So these are people who will also drink spirits. Maybe they like uh, some of the Amaros, the bitter spirits. Um, yeah, it's a good category. It's, I actually, I wish I was a little more in the sensitive and less in the hypersensitive. Uh, tolerant tasters, these are the people who really need to feel something. Like they need something big, bold. In the old days when they were sort of counting taste buds on the tongue, these people would have been at the lower end of the numerical scale. <laughs> We know that that's a bit of a farce now, and that certainly doesn't take in how your brain processes the information. Um, but yeah, whiskey drinking, cigar smoking, you know, big bold stuff, that's where it's at. So all of us fall somewhere on this, on this chart. There's some room for us to explore. Uh, I like bitter things, but I don't drink black coffee. Uh, the old way that they were judging that, they wouldn't be able to make sense of that necessarily. But, you know, it gives us just a rough grouping. If you're in the tolerant or the sweet category, don't worry about it. It's all good. We got a wine for you. So just keeping that in mind, um, I'm just going to take a quick detour through uh, the huge world of viticulture and enology. Um, you're going to see a lot of this in action. You're going to go see vineyards. You're going to go into wineries. So that will make a lot of sense to actually see tanks, pumps, rows of grapes. This is just sort of a quick primer so you can ask more questions, basically. Um, and this funny little graphic uh, comes from a friend of mine. This is his sort of holistic uh, vineyard to picking to maybe even touching the hand of God with your Cabernet at the end of the day, <laughs> 10 years later sort of thing. But it's fun because it gives an idea um, in this sort of yearly mandala of that is sort of what these two things do together. Uh, the grapevines go through a dormant period. They just started growing about a month ago. You'll see a lot of new growth. You can go out in the vineyard. You'll be able to see what new leaves look like. You'll see at the end of the canes, they've got little tendrils, and they're just going towards the sun, doing their really vigorous spring thing. Um, it's a beautiful time. This rain is going to make things more difficult. Uh, it'll add a little bit of extra work in the field to keep that growth under control. Um, it'll probably increase mildew pressure, too, but we can handle that. A little extra spray in the vineyard, and we can use very benign things like mineral oil. It's amazingly effective as it turned out, or has turned out. It's one of my favorite things to alternate with sulfur. Very benign. Um, then you go through, you get into the hot summer period. Uh, that's when the vines sort of stop their aggressive growth phase, and they sort of take a break and realize, hey, we're, we're, where are we going with this? What are we doing? And they'll actually stop physically growing. Uh, the grapes right now, they're all, if I don't think we've flowered yet. Maybe Nebbiolo has some early, early ripening things. Um, but like in southern Sonoma County, which is about two weeks ahead of where we are, because the winters aren't as cold, uh, you'll see that the little bunches are flowering. Each little grape is a flower right now. Little pistils, stamens, the whole thing has a little cap that pops off. Uh, one of the concerns is when it rains, like it has been, sometimes that cap sticks and doesn't properly. It's like a Think of it just like a fighter pilot ejecting out of the canopy. Sometimes the canopy doesn't pop off 
and that keeps everything from actually growing properly. And you get something called shatter. And sometimes that can be a good thing. It knocks down the crop load a little bit inside big bunches. Um, like Cabernet is very small, but Sangiovese, big bunch, uh, you can allow more air penetration and light penetration, so you can actually get better quality fruit. But if you're growing for tonnage, then you get a little bit concerned. So it just depends on where you are in the market. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. Just the world of wine, the small artisanal thing, like I touch every grapevine four times before we harvest the grapes. That's not practical if you have 500 acres in the Central Valley or low Valley. Um, we're also facing a real labor crisis and costs. Uh, Bay Area, <laughs> San Francisco is not a good model for anything, um, <laughs> but the restaurant industry is sort of in a mid-decimation period because you have to pay a line cook $25 an hour when five years ago it was only $12 an hour because nobody can afford to live there. And prices go up and consumers go to the next place is cheaper and it's a whole cycle. Uh, wine industry is having some similar issues which brings up mechanical things. If they're physically <coughs> paying somebody by the hour to physically touch every grapevine, how can we do this all mechanically? There's a lot of research going on with that. Um, but as we get into summer, the vines actually stop growing. You have these grapes that are in this green, like hard pea, very small phase. They'll actually start to change color. So your red grapes will go to purple or even blackish hues. White grapes, uh, some of them are white. Uh, Pinot Blanc is pretty white, but actually a lot of them, like Pinot Gris, almost look like red grapes. It has a lot of color to them. Gewürztraminer, very silvery. Uh, but they change color, they soften up, and the vines sort of, when the vines are in their aggressive growing period, they're growing upwards toward the sun, but also the roots are growing at the same time. It's called root flush. And there are two periods of the year when that happens. Um, so you want to make sure that when those grapes are doing that, that they're sort of properly cared for. So that they're, you know, if, if they need nutrients, that you're doing that. Um, I'm in the middle of what's called shoot thinning now, which is when you clear out extraneous growth. So you want to have a minimal number of canes and really focused growth on the vine um, so that the vine isn't wasting energy, so the grapes are getting enough sunlight so they can develop and all that. But they will stop that in about the middle of summer and stop growing and start directing all of that energy into the grapes. And that's when things get sort of, that's when things get real. Uh, they start to accumulate sugar, <coughs> they get sweeter, softer, and the flavors start to happen that we associate with wine. And that's usually in July, July, August, that starts to happen. Um, we have one grape called Alianico that's super late harvest. It's still green on September 5th, September 10th every year. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is never going to get right. And then it just manages to right at the end of the year. So you kind of see the color transition here. Uh, going into fall, that's when we start talking about things like hang time. Um, we're basically waiting for the grapes to get to the point where we feel like there's enough flavor, the acidity is right, there's enough tannin maturity if it's red, uh, that we start thinking about pick times. And that's when we're out in the vineyard sampling, checking sugar. And honestly, I start chewing on grapes uh, just about August 1st. Every day I'm out, I'll taste all 14 different varieties we have planted. And you're not just looking for those, you know, ethereal fruit flavors, it's also like, what does the tannin feel like? Um, there's a difference that we'll get to later where the seed, f seed tannin is different than skin tannin in the grape. So you're also watching and feeling what those things are like as they mature. Eventually get into harvest, and that's when the winery suddenly spring into action. Uh, lots of crush chaos. If you're a big winery, you're trying to ferment things as fast as possible, get the tank cleared for the next thing. If you're small artisanal, you might be doing weird stuff that ties up equipment for months. Um, I've got some, some Alianico that did a 100 day fermentation. A little experiments if you're making an orange wine which are white grapes just put in a big vat and closed up stems seeds everything for like three months up to five years you know that's that's a different sort of schedule than 
the quick rapid fire thing that most most wineries see. Um, and you'll see some medium sized wineries on this trip. They're pretty impressive. And when you look at a 20,000 gallon tank, that's a lot of grapes. But on the, you know, realistically, I think California crushed half a billion tons last year, something like that. We're just a drop in the bucket here. And little producers like me, like we don't even register. <laughs> so um, then you get into the whole winemaking cycle. And then there's a whole second stage of waiting things in barrels, waiting for whites to smooth out and get ready for bottling. If you're making big reds, it may need to spend three years in, in barrel. And then you've gone through several different crush cycles already. So it really is just sort of a continually spinning wheel. Um, so this is me planting Sagrantino out in the vineyard. Uh, if you plant later in the year, it really is digging 500 holes, running metal wires uh, in July when it's actually pretty warm here. So that's just the reality of it, and that's why labor can be an issue. But let's say that you want a million, no, you need more than a million. Let's say you want a billion dollars, and you want to start a winery. So you want to plant a vineyard. The things you have to think about, uh, if you're do gonna do it in California, in a warmer climate, what is your water availability? Can you dig a well? Um, at some point, you're going to need to water something if you're in most areas. There are areas like Sonoma Coast, uh, Santa Barbara. Um, there are certain areas where you can get by without irrigation. You'll hear the term dry farmed sometimes, which are old grapevines that don't receive irrigation. It takes probably a solid 30, 40, 50 years for them to become self-sufficient. They're amazing things. Uh, there are some up at, just outside of Calistoga you can go look at. Calistoga is a very warm area. Uh, these hundred year old vines are very grizzled. They have arms sort of everywhere. They look bent over. Um, really amazing. They hardly yield anything. If you're buying grapes from those, you're paying a lot for it. But they're survivors. That's the thing. You lose a lot of vines on the way to establishing a vineyard like that, but it's a good goal for us to keep in mind that we're planting a vineyard. Is can they become self-sufficient someday and make it 100 years, 150 years? Uh, sometimes you can find little treasured troves of them, like in Lodi, where you used to be able to get 100-year-old vine something, Carignan, way, way below market because it was from Lodi. They've done a good job of rebranding that, so definitely give Lodi wine a chance. It's really sort of remade itself over the last last decade. Um, but you gotta think about all the factors. Uh, is it too hot? I mean, there are a lot of hot, think of Spain and Portugal in the Duro Valley, like steep, sun-beaten. Um, and think about cold Germany. They grow grapes in a lot of different areas. Uh, but you have to be able to have some amount of soil, you know, pure rock just isn't quite enough there. And often what you see on the surface is not necessarily what's down underneath. So you can have clay over limestone, and then that's a good situation because limestone sort of absorbs water in the winter and then slowly, slowly doles it out to the grapevine roots. We don't have much of that in California, but if we're in France, you want to be on limestone for your Pinot and Chardonnay. If not, you're that's second rate real estate. Uh, does a tractor need to get up and down it? What about a crew, labor? Um, if it was dedicated to some other use, a lot of things here were walnut orchard. Ideally, you want to pull out those and let it fallow for at least a year to kind of starve out the insects that are in there. Uh, but that's hard to do if you're paying for land to let it just sit there for a year. We haven't been very good about that kind of anxious, to be honest. Um, what do you want to grow? You're kind of, you can want to grow Pinot on a sunny 100 degree hilltop all you want, but it's not gonna work. So on some level, you have to dis respect where you're at. That's always gonna trump you know, whatever sort of dreams you have. Um, and then you get into the whole world of labor things like harvesting. Can you get crews out there? You can have an amazing vineyard in the middle of nowhere. There are 
great examples of this, uh, especially like Sierra foothills. Um, there's some in Southern California in the interior, uh, but you can't pay people enough to go drive three hours to go work in the hot sun, unless you're gonna do it yourself. Um, and then the future of mechanical stuff. So me, as a grape grower and winemaker, I fetishize super steep hillside, rocky, like, you know, the most extreme land possible, realistically, it won't be maintainable <laughs> as a vineyard. There are limits to it. Um, there are amazing places like the North Rhone Valley and, you know, 45 degree slate slopes in Germany. And, you know, maybe if your family has been working those for 200 years and they're the labor, that's good. But sometimes, just as a business, you can't just plant <coughs> uh, clones and root stocks. That's where we sort of get into that grocery store. Like, you know, uh, we've got Sangiovese planted. We have five different types of Sangiovese planted. There are over a hundred different types of Sangiovese. Pinot and Cabernet are the same way. Grapevines mutate. The leaves change shape. You get different aromatics, different tannin levels. Uh, if you ever see Camargue clone Pinot. It's known as the soupy clone, uh, much darker, very full-bodied. Um, if I was planting a Pinot vineyard and I wanted it to be kind of cool climate, but I wanted it to have some body like a Russian river, uh, I would probably plant like 20% Camargue clone and then start thinking about, you know, we have five different types of Sangiovese, two are very tannic, one is very floral, two are the core of the finished wine. It can get as fine-grained as you want. Um, and then there's root stocks, and those, the part of the vine below the ground, there are areas that don't need that. Uh, Eastern Washington is very sandy. A lot of Eastern Washington is on its own roots. Um, some of the old world areas, Chile, Argentina in some areas, uh, there's this discussion, do grapes from grapevines on their own roots taste different? I, not much closure on that topic yet. I'm sure there's some sort of difference. I don't know how powerful it is, but certainly the idea of having grapevines that are own rooted uh, is pretty pretty exciting. And you got to think about the work cycle. Uh, do you do cover crops? Are you you're going to need to spray for mildew in a lot of places? Um, there are several rounds of field work. Uh, there's not only a shooting <coughs> that I'm doing now, but as grapes start to change color, you might drop some of that crop. You don't want to have any bunches touching. You want to have full light wrap and uh, air to go between the bunches. Then you got to send a crew back out to make sure nothing is touching, nothing is crossing, no bunched up fruit. That's another round of labor. Some grapes, like Cabernet family, have uh, some extra little issues that are particular to them. Uh, everything in the Cab Franc family, which includes Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Malt, no, sorry, not Maldec, Merlot, uh, and Carmenere, mm -hmm. they have a chemical called pyrazine in them, which is that green bell pepper flavor, So that, and but it degrades in sunlight. So you want to do some additional leafing to get enough of that out of there so that people won't say your wine tastes like a jalapeno pepper. <laughs> uh, it can be pretty amazing. Um, I, I was, until 2013, doing a Carmenere blend. Fortunately, there was just enough fruit to balance it out, but it smells and tastes like roasted roasted tomatoes and green grilled bell pepper. Mm -hmm. Super strong. Really unique. Mm -hmm. Not to everybody's liking. Mm -hmm. And then the whole issue of how do you get the grapes from the vineyard to the winery. This is where a lot of things actually go wrong. Um, there's a winery in uh, Berkeley that gets a lot of their grapes from the Sierra foothills on the other side of California trucking them through early September heat to the Central Valley. They're very hands-off, uh, very natural, and a lot of the wines are screwed up because of it. A lot of things, transportation is very, very important. So if they've got to go too far, that can be difficult. Um, for us, fortunately, the winery is right next to the vineyard. And then there are a lot of choices just leading into, uh, a lot of times, the winery is full. I mean, they can't even crush grapes in the middle of harvest. Things sit for a day. Things sit for two days. 
I made some wine for somebody who had stuff sitting in cold storage for six weeks. Mm. Thought somebody was going to buy it, they didn't buy it. Thought I had another buyer, didn't buy it. A um, little bit less than optimal. I think it actually came out pretty good, all things considered, but you know, that's something to think about. You got to have some workflow. And then you get into the winery cycle. And if you have to start a vineyard, I hope you don't have to start a winery. Because if you think starting a vineyard is bad, the logistics of creating a winery out of scratch is something else. Um, but when it's humming and flowing, it's the middle of harvest, it's, for me, more exciting than working a restaurant line on a busy night. It's, it's six weeks of pretty, pretty great trying stuff. It's really exciting. But there's a basic cycle of what goes on. And it can be divided into two categories, white grapes and red grapes. Sometimes those cross over. Something like a rosé of red wines can be treated like a white grape or a white wine from red grapes. Um, sometimes you do skin contact with whites, and then they're a little bit like a red wine. Uh, and then rosé is you know, in the middle. But you crush the grapes. They start fermenting. And then there are a lot of choices from there, what you do with that. Once the fermentation is over, you'll often, usually for both whites and reds, you'll let some of the, there's a lot of muck in there. And the wines are really cloudy, really hazy. Um, let them settle for a day or two. And then if they're whites, maybe you keep them in, you'll move them to another tank to age a little bit so that they stay fresh. Uh, if they're big reds, you'll put them in barrel, stack up the barrels and let them start their aging process. Uh, that can go anywhere from if you're making Beaujolais Nouveau, five days, to three years, five years. Maybe you're making a port style wine and it's going to spend 20 years in a barrel. So it's a lot of leeway and stylistic decision to make in there. Uh, when they get ready for, when you think something's getting close to bottling, um, you do a lot of tasting. Are you going to blend? Are you going to do these different aspects or opposite for a white. I want it super fresh and bright and fruity. Uh, so I want to get it in the bottle as fast as possible. Maybe you lucked out and you're selling out a wine. Uh, you can either choose to filter it. And I don't know why this has filtration before aging. You generally don't do that. Um, but getting it into bottle as fast as possible. And this is a problem that we have in the wine industry. So wineries are very expensive to set up. Harvest happens, your barrels are full, your tanks are full, and suddenly it's already the next August and grapes are gonna start coming soon. So we used to be under pressure to bottle simultaneously with harvest. So, because we didn't have enough barrel storage. Wine comes out, wine goes in. Not an ideal situation. But if you're building a winery, you want to make sure you have enough space for everything. And you'll see some of the technology. It's pretty amazing. Um, there are automated tank systems, pumping. Uh, you can freeze tanks virtually, which is something you like to do for whites to get them cold stabilized. Um, this was just an interesting graphic that you probably can't read. I can barely read it. Uh, but these are fermentation choices uh, before a wine is even done fermenting. Um, so it goes all the way from that time when you're out in the vineyard, checking the grapes, chewing on the grapes. And in California, honestly, we can do whatever we want. Lots of other parts of the world, uh, they're governed by the local grape authorities. Uh, lots of areas you can't irrigate your vines. There are places, uh, a lot of Italian places, there are limits on how much you can yield per acre. If you go over that, then your wine gets demoted. So it may have been a DOC wine in the mid-tier, some really cool place, uh, but it was a very heavy, heavy vintage. And vintage is really varied. Um, and you got, you know, a lot of times, it'll be like 200 hectoliters per hectare. Ask me to translate that into tons and acres, but the, often it's a lot less than what we produce in California. And suddenly your $30 bottle is now a $15 country wine bottle because it was a heavy vintage and you weren't able to do the vineyard 
work. So there's a lot of government involved at some level with a lot of these things. Um, and even the winemaking processes in some areas are limited to what you can do. Uh, like in Portugal, you'll see advertised on some labels, making port, a lot of times it would, they would basically use a swimming pool of stone, made of stone, about this big, coming up to about here, and then they have people just jump in there and walk all day, and it's a traditional stone uh, lagar, I think they call it, foot tread, you know, uh, very artisanal, very old, we've been using the same stone swimming pool for 400 years, that kind of thing. Um, all the way up to the most high-tech thing you can imagine. Bordeaux tends to be very high-tech, uh, and a lot of what the California wine industry mirrors a lot of the research that's been done there, especially since that's the land of Cabernet. If you're a Pinot person, it's all little old men and ladies making a few barrels in their cellars. So they all have these little tiny, like five rows out of 50 rows on this one hillside getting divided by the family. These are people that grow their own grapes, and it's kind of the opposite of the Bordeaux model. California is more on the Bordeaux model, but a lot of us are more on the Burgundian sort of like micro-producer model. They have these really stinky, moldy basements that have been, you know, been using them for 300 years. They've coated in wine mold and grime, uh, but that ends up being part of the microbial identity of the wine. It works for them. Some places in Germany, of course, cultural, spotless, perfect, stainless. Um, there are a couple steps in here where you have to make a big choice. So you crush your grapes, stomp, or mechanically crush them. There's something called sannier. Do you want to make a rosé? Do you want to make an easy rosé where you just bleed off 10% of the freshly pressed red juice to make a light pink rosé? A lot of people do. You get more concentration in the finished red wine, and you get the bonus of having a few cases of rosé also. It's often a good choice for wine, for grapes, when you're kind of looking at them saying, I don't know if this is the quality it should be for the expensive bottle. Rosés have become very popular, um, and stylistically, they're all over the board now. And that's really exciting. There are some amazing rosés out there. It took a while to catch on with consumers, but it's there. So some of us are even making rosés like, dedicated red grapes that we like. Uh, I made some rosé for a person last year um, out of some, <coughs> of some of our grapes that I really didn't want to. But he was like, I'll pay you. Okay, I'll make a little bit out of it. Some of our best grapes, I'll be damned if it didn't make the best rosé we've made so far. Unfortunately, it was his. <laughs> Had to get a lesson learned. I'm going to struggle with that this year because it was a really good rosé. You get what you pay for even on the winery level. Uh, but in California, you can add water if you need to, if your grapes are dehydrated, kind of pruney. Uh, warm climates struggle with that. Paso down in the south, we do Central Valley. It's not uncommon to add a little bit of water. Say uh, maybe the grapes are pretty ripe and you might have a 17% alcohol wine. You can add enough water to bring it down to Amazingly, it doesn't really seem to affect the finished product that much. For most of us, we try not to do that, but that's more of a safety, you know, not damage control, because it's pretty common practice, but um, it happens a lot. Uh, usually, if you have to add water and the grapes are really ripe, you may need to add acid. So as grapes mature, they metabolize their acid. The acid drops, potential alcohol goes up. Uh, so often, those two things are added simultaneously. Add a little water, add a little acid. Again, not allowed in a lot of areas of the world. In some areas of Spain, uh, the authorities will get together and say, oh, well, but it was a really hot vintage. We don't allow them to irrigate. We'll let them add one gram a liter of acid, or you'll get a pass for the season. Conversely, you've probably heard about uh, chaptalization in Burgundy, which is when they add sugar to bring the alcohol up. So not uncommon practice in really cool climates where they're, and honestly right now with the whole natural wine thing, I've had, and I did wine retail for the last three years, so that's why I had such a broad uh, introduction.
introduction to things I wouldn't have been able to taste normally. 10% alcohol wines are really in style right now. A lot of small producers are making them. So think of a 10% alcohol Cabernet. It's really neat, it's really different, and kind of watery. There's something to be said for that, though. High acid, spicy, angular. It's, it's pretty unique. Uh, in the old days, they might add sugar to bump up that alcohol because the alcohol gives it body also. Kind of bridges everything together. Um, so that would be adjusting acidity. Sulfur is a huge topic, sulfur usage. Um, unless you have a legitimate, like, asthmatic meltdown problem with sulfur, I wouldn't worry about it. It gets way blown out in the press and Facebook discussions where nobody knows anything about anything. <laughs> Our bodies produce about a gram and a half of sulfur a day. For most of us, it's not a problem. Sulfur comes in many forms. Um, if you're worried about it, uh, I actually worked this out in my mind. Um, a lot of Berkeley folk are very concerned about sulfur. Um, in a normal 750 mil bottle, if you took an aspirin tablet, broke it into 16 pieces, that, that 1 16th of a tablet is about the equivalent amount of sulfur in a whole bottle of wine. It's not that much. And you would know if you had a problem with it. So, but I get headaches from wine. I don't know what it is in there. It's something. It's probably ethanol, actually. <laughs> um, but there's lots of stuff in wine that we're still figuring out. So you can have histamine things, that trigger reactions, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but usually sulfur is not, not the culprit. Sulfur sort of protects a wine and gets it to you in decent condition. Uh, it's an antioxidant. And if you get moldy grapes, it helps suppress that. It helps keep wine from smelling like nail polish remover and other things. Sometimes a little bit's OK, but you want to protect your grapes. Um, but we all use as little as possible. I've, every single winemaker talks about minimal sulfur these days. I have yet to ever meet a winemaker who uses maximal sulfur. And this is all regulated too. You can't go above a certain limit. Uh, so that's one of the steps. A little more industrial winemaking. Do you want to add an enzyme that can break down the grapes, get more color? Uh, do you want to add a clarifying agent at the end? Sure, maybe. Uh, there's something called cold soak. The Pinot people are very into cold soak. Pinot is a very fragile, thin-skinned grape. So what you do is you crush it, you bring it down to about 40 degrees so nothing happens microbially, and you let it sit for five to seven days. They feel like that gives them better color. Uh, I will say Lake County grapes, just since you're in the area. Uh, we get really good structure in, well, structure. Structure is a coded word for tannin. It's a nicer way of saying dry, chalky sensation. Uh, but we get a lot of tan in here. We've got altitude, we've got rocky soils, we've got sunlight. Um, so cold soaking and extended fermentations don't always work out here. If I was in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, I would probably do it. And I've experimented with this also. Um, depends on the grape, too. So then you go into the full fermentation thing. This winery has all sorts of choices with their juice. How much do you pump it over? Do you punch it down? Do you mix the tank four times a day? Uh, do you just barely sprinkle it one time a day? If it's a big tannin grape, big bold cabernet, you probably don't want to beat it up too much. Some grapes uh, like to be beaten up. <laughs> Our Barbera, I actually handle pretty aggressively, and it seems just fine with that. They really do vary. Um, got one grape called Dolcetto that doesn't want to be touched at all. It's very finicky. Um, so then you get into clones and what the goal is. All these other different things, adding this, subtracting that. Eventually you get to the end of fermentation. Um, so mo 